So uh, I, I do a book show on much, where um, we talk to you do what a book show. Oh. We talk to different people about fave books that you've read and how it's inspired you or what you learned from it or something like that. Mm -hmm. So do you have a book that um, that comes back to you every once in a while? Yeah. Well, I've read Perfume by Patrick Suskin about ten times in my life, and. Uh, I can't stop reading it. It's like something that's just stationary in my pocket all the time. It just doesn't leave me. And every time I'm bored, like I'm on an airplane or something, I read it over and over again. Because I'm a hypochondriac, and it just affects me. It makes me want to cut my nose off. What's the book about? It's about this um, perfume apprentice in, in um, France at the turn of the century. And he, um, he uh, is just disgusted, basically, with all humans. And he just can't get away from humans, so he goes on this trek this uh, walk of death where he just, he goes into the rural areas where there's, you know, woods all over the place in the small villages and, and he only travels by night and um, he, he just, every time he smells human, like a fire from a far off way, you know, he'll, um, he'll just get really disgusted and hide and he just tries to stay away from people. I can relate to that. <laughs> Do you ever use what you read in any of your songs? As a matter of fact, I use that very story in Scentless Apprentice. Yeah. So um, that's really one of the first times that I've ever used a, an actual story, you know, as a, as a book, as an example of a song. You know, I've always tried to stay away from that, but now that I'm running out of ideas more and more, I, I, I tend to do that. Is it hard when? Uh you spend your whole life doing the first few albums and then suddenly everybody needs your attention. You have to do interviews, you have to travel around and suddenly it's, it's, is it hard to come up with ideas? Uh, I don't know, I've just, I've just noticed that people expect, expect more of a thematic angle with, with our music. You know, they always want to read into it. And before I was just using pieces of poetry and just, just garble, just garbage, you know, just stuff that just would spew out of me at the time. And a lot of times when I write lyrics, it's just the last second because I'm really lazy. So, and then I'm, I find myself having to come up with explanations for it, you know, so I thought I'd, you know, prevent that this time and, and actually have an explanation for some of the songs at least. There's a lot of baby references in all the songs. I, I, I didn't think there would be, but you have like wombs, babies, <laughs> baby's breath, baby throw up, every, baby, baby throw up? Baby, there's baby oh, everywhere. Lying. Is that, this is a, obviously have become a, a huge part of your life. It, it has been a part of my life before Courtney was even pregnant though. I've always been just fascinated with medical texts and charts and I guess I secretly want to be a doctor or something, I don't know. Yeah. Or, a, <laughs> or a person that works in a cremation factory. I don't know, I just, I've always liked anatomy. I, you know, ever since I was a little kid, you know, when I first got that little model of the invisible man, you know, or the visible man, it's it just, just something that I really like. And since I've, I've become a big rock star and, and made a bunch of money. I found this place in, in the Mall of America in Minneapolis that sells nothing but um, medical stuff. It's a medical supply store that's turned in, that they've offered to the public, you know. It, it's really great. I bought all these fetuses and, you know, anatomy men and charts and stuff. And it was like a dream come true, you know. Because I've always, you know, I've always been really poor and, and if I could find something like that in a, in a second-hand store, I'd barely have enough money to buy it. And a lot of times I couldn't buy that stuff, so I just went on this rampage of buying all this stuff. And, and I've used, I think I've overused it, you know, for like pictures for the album. And I don't know, I just, just went overboard on it. You know, the, the old saying that you can't buy happiness, you think that's true? <laughs> well, yeah, you can't buy happiness. I mean, that made me happy for a little while. <laughs> but, I mean, I was just probably almost just as happy with, you know, fine. I don't know. I used to, I, I look back on going to secondhand stores and stuff like that and finding a little treasure like that. And that actually meant more to me because it was, it was more of a stab in the dark in a way, you know, because you didn't know if you're going to be able to afford it and you don't know what you're really looking for and when you find it it's it's more special to you rather than you know having a thousand dollars and going into a store like that and just buying the whole store you know it's it's not as you know, it's not as special 
because you've achieved so much success I mean, so, so quickly, so surprisingly, you've had a baby, you're married. What excites you now? <laughs> my baby and my marriage. I don't know. I still like playing, too. I, I mean, Chris and Dave and I haven't changed at all. I mean, believe it or not, we, we get along just as well as we ever did. You know, we're just as the same passive-aggressive people as we used to be. You know, we never fight. And when we're pissed off at each other, we just hold it under our breath and have respect for one another in that way, you know. It's just, it's easier to, it's easier to work that way, you know, because we have a mission, <laughs> I guess. How do you, uh, how do you personally cope with having relationships, pu private relationships that are always being scrutinized publicly? It must be really difficult. Well, it is, but, I mean, I... You know, I still have a lot of the same friends that I used to have, so they don't seem to mind. And, and that isn't ever really exposed too much, you know. No one, no one writes about how me and my friend Dylan walked down the street and you know, did whatever. But um, yeah, but they rip apart you and Courtney. They love, they love to do that. Yeah, I, I don't know why, but um, you know, we're just. Um, I don't know. I guess like my ego could be talking right now, and I could say, "Well, we're interesting people," you know. But I think we're just easy scapegoats. It's just, you know, it started with something, and then you know, people just pick up on it and carry it along, and we turn into cartoon characters. And <laughs> there's nothing I can do about it, really. You know, I can threaten to sue, and you know, try to try to, um, you know, bring up bring up libel laws and stuff like that to people that write shit like that about us but you know if you've ever looked into that it's pretty much a lost cause you have to have a lot of money to do that and, you know I could spend the money that I earned last year all on fighting the Vanity Fair piece you know and they'd end up winning because they have more money you know so there's a there's a, a magazine in Canada that um, incorporates itself for each issue and then it goes bankrupt on each issue so that it could write whatever it wants and no one could ever sue them. Wow, that's a pretty smart thing to do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it is. That's, that kind of reminds me of um, how um, a lot of stations in the States got a hold of our, um, our new album, but it was like someone had anonymously sent them like fifth generation cassette copies of our new album and in order for them to play it, they started on the weekend at 5 o'clock, like on Friday nights. That way they could play it throughout the rest of the weekend without having a council, you know, sue them. And, um, I don't know, that's kind of, that's kind of smart, <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's free publicity for you anyway. Ultimately, the album's well, going to come out. That's true, but the thing is, is that there's been so much controversy about how bad the record sounds, you know, and, and how um, <clears throat> lo-fi it is. And to hear it like that compared to all the other songs that were on the radio that night, it really disgusted me and it pissed me off because it sounded terrible. It sounded really, really bad. And then everyone that heard it that weekend is going to say, yeah, you're right. Okay, the, the, the stories are true. The Nirvana album really sucks and I'm not going to buy it, you know? So it just kind of bothered me, but we took care of it. What'd you do? Well, I thought maybe we should hire a lawyer to stop them to do it, then instead I just decided to hire a hitman. Pardon me? <laughs> nothing, nothing. Erase them. No, we just, we just called them up on Monday and told them to stop. And they went, oh, okay. Well, our lawyer did that. Mm. Yeah. Isn't that a weird world for you to suddenly have lawyers and like people who do stuff like that for you? Yeah. <laughs> it's totally unnecessary, too. If, it, if we weren't in this position, we wouldn't need lawyers, you know? It's just, it's total unnecessary and we have to spend a lot of money just to protect ourselves all the time and it's just stupid. When did that first hit you? When did you realize that you're going to need some people on your team to protect you from the vultures? Too late. <laughs> you know, much after the fact, after we'd already been damaged to a point where it you know, almost didn't do any good. You know? But, um, I don't know, it was just a weird realization one day. Wow, I have to, you know, and I can see how like rock and roll stars will all of a sudden, well, will almost compromise their music to um, to make sure that they sell the same amount of records next year because they've spent all their money on lawyers and protecting themselves last year, you know. But I mean, we obviously haven't done that. I mean, I don't know, maybe you might not have noticed, but the record isn't as commercial as the last one, so. 
I just, we could never bring ourselves to do that, you know. I'd rather just laugh about it. And I, I was talking to um, Amy Mann, a girl from Till Tuesday. She was at, at, at our office just a couple days ago. She's on tour with Ray Dave or the Kinks, and Ray mm -hmm. Davies was in the office also. He came in before her, and I had mentioned to her that he was very nice but really eccentric when I was talking to him, kind of nutty. And she said, well, you know, there's a lot of people who have been around the record business for those many years, and most of them are kind of nutty. <laughs> it just, you know, it just, it makes people nutty. Yeah. Can you, can, can, I mean, you have to, you ha you're facing that. That's your future. Yeah, that's my future. Um, hopefully, we'll put out Metal Machine music next year, you know. I don't know. Um, Either I've accepted it or I've gone beyond insane to where I can deal with it uh, emotionally. I just, I really don't care. I, I don't, I know that I'm too stubborn to allow myself to ever compromise their music or, you know, get so wrapped up in it and involved to where it's going to, you know, make, turn us into big rock stars. I mean, I just don't feel like that. Everyone else accuses us of it, but, you know, we're everyone not as jealous. popular as everyone thinks or we're not as rich as everyone things, you know, it's just, it's just, we've always had a good sense of humor, I don't think that's very, been translated very well, you know, but we'd rather laugh about it, ha ha ha. You know what really surprised me though is you're, you're, you're pretty bright and your lyrics are, and, and just your whole stage persona is pretty angry, angst-ridden, frustrated, I mean, you see the world for what it is. Did you ever have second thoughts about bringing a child into the world the way oh, it is? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I I really can't describe what what changed our attitude so fast. I think you know I was I really was a lot more negative and, and angry and everything else a few years ago. But that was that had a lot to do with um, not having not having a mate. You know, not having a, a steady girlfriend and stuff like that. So, I, you know, that was one of the main things that was that was bothering me that I wouldn't admit at the time. You know, so now that I've found that, the world seems a lot better for some reason. You know, it just it really does change your attitude about things. You know, I mean, four years ago I would have said you know, the classic thing like, um, you know, how dare someone bring a child into this life? You know, it's it's completely a terrible way to go and you know the world's going to explode any day and stuff like that but once you fall in love it's, it's a bit different I don't want to know about it stop <laughs> <laughs> George and I are not in the best love situations right now so we oh. stop talking about that we'll change the subject <laughs> what I want to talk to you about um, I'm not you, boasting about it it's just no, it's something nice. that's really it's really nice weird. to even talk about it that you know that you have something like that to talk about. <laughs> it's nice. Uh, you know. Th what, you hold this for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Do you mind? I'm really, what, I'm feeling a little weak. Um, you know that this whole grunge thing that this in quotations grunge. All I want to know is where did the term come from? I have no idea. I think some of the rumors are that. Um, Jonathan Poneman said it one time sarcastically, and it just caught on. Who's that? He's um, one of the head honchos at Sub Pop Records. But, um, no one set out to market it, market this music as that. You know, just you know, that's what happens when the main media, the media catches on. They have to call it something. I like it as much as New Wave. I would have been proud to be a New Waver. You know, 15 years ago. Oh yeah, well, we were about the same age. I was into new wave. Absolutely. Do you think you Me have too. some of the same? The s is there anything the same between your music and new wave? I think so. Like what? Well, like you know, new wave was just a progression from punk rock and a mutation of punk rock. You know, and it was more commercial and more palatable. You know, it, was, it had, you know, punk rock roots, and it was easier to swallow for for the media and middle America in the middle of the world and, and it's just you know that's what I kind of think about our music. Are you worried about a Nirvana backlash? Hasn't that already been over with? Hasn't that already happened? I don't know. <laughs> sure. I no. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What else I want to talk to you about? Uh, we're, we're getting more new wave as the days go by. 
I think we're going to reinvent New Wave and, and bring back breakdancing. I'd really like to bring back New Wave and, and breakdancing, you know, meld it to something. I don't know. That's what our new music is sounding like. We're using a lot more effects boxes and we're, we're we haven't resorted to skinny ties, but we're going to, I think we're, our music's, you know, this, this album's like the closing of the chapter of, of the formula we've been using, you know, it's like grunge is, it's really kind of boring for us, you know, it's something we can't deny and we're not going to stop playing the old songs live, whoops, and, um, but, you know, we're, our tastes are just changing so rapidly that we're really experimenting with a lot of stuff and it might get too indulgent and be really embarrassing for the next album <laughs> but we can't put out another album and this is just like the last chapter of, of three chord grunge music for us and um, it was an easy thing to do and a safe thing to do because we knew it's still popular you know but we had to get it out of our systems how come you are so nice, and you're so you seem so comfortable with yourself. Something must have really happened in the last couple of years. Is it is it just falling in love? No. What happened? I've always been a nice guy. Maybe you were afraid to show it before. How's that? <laughs> well, um, what? I don't know. You, you've never met me before. I never met so. you before, but I know that other people who have had the opportunity to interview, and you went, they said, oh, he hates doing interviews. He's not going to want to talk about anything. Well. And I said, well, you know, whatever. Who knows? <laughs> and you're just like exactly the opposite of, of... It just depends on what mood I'm in, really. Yeah, I'm kind of a moody person, and a lot of times when someone has had the chance to talk to me, I've probably been on tour, or I've probably yeah. gone through an exhausted time where I've talked about myself for hours and hours, and this week I haven't had to talk about myself very much, so Lucky probably me. more cooperative. <laughs> um, I think one of the interesting things about Nirvana that, that you don't really talk about that much is that you're very concerned about sexism. I like that. That's, that's, that's good. So how do you... Uh, how do you make people aware of that problem? By writing songs as blunt as rape me. <laughs> Having to resort to doing something like that is almost embarrassing because um, people didn't understand when we wrote a song like about a girl or Polly and having to explain that and having misunderstandings about it, it's just, I decided to write rape me in a way that was just so blunt and obvious that it's like no one could deny it, you know, no one could read into it any other way, you know, although some people have actually because some of the lyrics in it, some of the, some people have thought that maybe um, it has something to do with my disgust with the media and the way they've treated us and stuff like that, but it's not true. It's, that's not what the song's about at all. It's just my way of, in a sarcastic way almost, of like just saying how obvious do we have to be, you know. I guess we don't talk about those kind of things that you know that are really important to us because um, because um, I don't want to be thought of as like nothing more than a PC band, you know. I mean, we're entertainers, <laughs> you know. That's what music is, and so it's it's really hard to you know step over the lines. You know, Just that you have so there. much power because that camera's on you, and <laughs> you, you can use it. <laughs> Yeah, well, we try to use our power. I mean, we really have been effective in certain ways, like being associated with this um, organization called FAIR, and I can't remember right now because I have a mental block of exactly what it stands for, but it's something like, ah, um, uh, shit, I can't remember. <laughs> but it, but they're, they're an organization who um, who looks at the injustices that are, that are, they look at the details that around that surrounds certain issues and certain um, stories that have been that have been um, reported in, in in magazines and newspapers like USA Today who, who tend to you know look over a lot of the facts and, and um, they're pretty much a leftist organization that um, tries to protect people in, in certain areas you know and they and they supposedly try as hard as they can to um, you know, to deliver the truth, and 
So, you know, we've done benefits like that for like no on nine benefits for, to try to stop, um, to try to stop um, Portland's um, anti-gay laws that they were trying to pass. And, and we did a Bosnian benefit and stuff like that. And, you know, it doesn't seem like much, but, you know, we raised like $50,000 for the Bosnian rape victims, you know, and that's a lot more than we could have done griping about it and talking about it in interviews and like maybe putting out a fanzine you know there's nothing wrong with doing stuff like that but you know we're using our we're using the tools that we've we have you know Good. and we're being effective as much as we can but we still don't want to be too political at the same time you know because it's just kind of embarrassing to do that or you know you get a lot of ridicule for it yeah but you're doing what you believe in and that's the most important thing yeah. it's hard not to you know I mean, if you're put in this position, what are you going to do? You become a Republican or something? You know? <laughs> Just to protect what you've earned, big deal. Mm -hmm.